Oh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the special event of the Y Division of the NMRA. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Norman uh, uh, Sudam, I think I got that correct here, um, for talking about uh, Pacific Electric uh, models uh, by the uh, um, Sudam uh, company. Um, so I'll let you uh, take it away, Norman. Thank you, Mike. And greetings from hot, dry, almost on fire, California. Uh, kind of wish I was somewhere else besides here. Uh, I just retired recently and bought a, a RV trailer and I'm gonna be traveling around the US to find my perfect retirement place. So all I know is it's not California. So anyway, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a presentation that I've done about seven or eight times previously for uh, a couple of model railroad clubs in the Southern California area and some of the uh, regional NMRA organizations uh, done this and at uh, convention, uh, other, other events. Um, a lot of times people that will see my last name and they'll go, oh, wait a minute, you know, uh, model railroad buildings. Oh, yeah. Uh, Brass trolley cars, Pacific Electric is kind of the big connection. And so uh, the presentation was primarily kind of set up with that in mind as to uh, the PE, Pacific Electric, uh, real big influence in Southern California. Uh, and so uh, the primary cars that were imported by Saddam are the Pacific Electric. And so I'll kind of go through all of this. Um, a little about myself. Um, prof uh, professional civil engineer, retired, like I said. Um, I designed and built freeways in the Los Angeles area. Uh, been a model railroader since the mid 60s. Uh, got three grown daughters. Uh, got one grandson. I got a second grandson that's due in about three weeks. And so in, in a couple of days, gonna hop on a plane and head over to Europe to see my new grandson. And so that's why we're trying to cram this, this presentation in here because uh, after this, I'm gonna be gone for like five weeks then I'm only gonna be back for like two weeks and I'm gonna see my other daughter uh, for another three weeks. And so it's, uh, I'm gonna be kind of going all over the place which is uh, what I guess retired people should do. Um, who am I? Um, Norman Saddam, I am the son of Douglas Saddam and I'm the nephew of Ed Saddam. Uh, and the two Saddam brothers uh, formed a business right after World War II uh, called E. Saddam and Company. Now, in 1947, right after World War II, they started manufacturing camera adapters. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of these. Um, after World War II, a lot of GIs were coming back from the European theater with high quality cameras that they purchased in Germany. The problem with that is the uh, cameras were designed to have cut film, very large pieces of negative film that would be put in one at a time, a picture be taken, they put a slide in, take it out, turn it around, put it back in, take another picture. It was very cumbersome, very expensive because uh, the the black and white film was made with silver nitrate uh, emulsion. And so it was kind of expensive, kind of expensive to buy the film, kind of expensive to process. It was a very large format of negatives, but it gave you very high quality uh, images. Uh, the cameras here the, have these uh, like accordion type bellows, sometimes they'll refer to those as a Pressman type of camera. And so these adapters went on the backside to replace this more expensive film and to also utilize new roll film that Kodak just came out. Now on a roll, you'd have 12, 18, maybe 24 pictures on one roll, which was very affordable. It's a little bit smaller in size and it costs less to develop and get prints, but it was very popular. And so for a number of years, uh, they were selling these roll film adapters. Uh, but one of the problems with that is like everything, the market will eventually get uh, saturated. And that's what happened with uh, that particular product. Now here, here are the two brothers. My dad's on the left, 
Ed is on the right. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were both inducted into the Model Railroad Industry Hall of Fame. Uh, I never knew there was such a thing, except I went to a, um, one of the big train shows uh, that was held at a convention center. And I think it was Bachman Trains was bringing along these kiosks. I think there was like th two or three separate kiosks kind of promoting the hobby. And one of the kiosks was the quote, Hall of Fame. And what they did is they honored a number of the people that were like founders in uh, the industry. Uh, uh, AC Kalmbach for uh, Kalmbach Magazines. Uh, Lynn Westcott for his writing in Model Railroader. Um, uh, Lionel, Lionel Trains, um, Irv Athern, Athern Trains. A lot of these people are put in there that contributed to the industry. And so a number of years ago, Mike DeGhetto, Mike DeGhetto is the person that owned Alpine uh, division scale models, which was the old Saddam line he had purchased from somebody else. And he uh, nominated Ed and Doug to get into this Hall of Fame. And so when the uh, national convention for the NMRA was being held in Sacramento, uh, they said, sure, somebody from California, we'll, we'll give the, the award to them. And so Mike uh, nominated Ed and uh, Doug and uh, went to the, uh, a, a luncheon, or it's actually a breakfast for the um, Model Railroad Industry Association. Many years ago, Mariah, or the Model Railroad Industry Association was just purely trains. And they were in the Southern California area when they first started because a number of the manufacturers were in Southern California. Uh, at the time, the two big hotbeds for hobby products, primarily HO hobby products, was Milwaukee and Los Angeles. And uh, if you go back and take a look at any of the old magazines from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you'll see all the addresses, those were the two places that had a lot of them. So Mariah started in Southern California. My uncle was uh, treasurer for it for a number of years. Uh, they later merged with the Hobby Manufacturers Association, HMA, also includes things like RC aircraft, RC boats and cars, and uh, like the Revell plastic kits you put together. And so more of a broader spectrum of the hobby, but the model railroad industry portion of it uh, honored them with this Hall of Fame award. Um, I've got the one for Doug, uh, my great nephew, whose name is Edward Reeb, uh, after his grandfather, Edward, has, has the other plaque here. So. That's kind of a neat thing. When Isadam first started off, they were actually in uh, Ed's in-laws garage. A lot of times model uh, manufacturers, they call it a cottage industry. And literally people would be running the business out of their house, out of their garage or some shed in the back or something like that. And that's what they did when they first started. And so eventually they moved into this uh, particular location here, which was in Pasadena, California, uh, just up from the Rose Bowl. And uh, this was probably, I don't have a date for this, but I would say it was probably about 1951, uh, early 50s that they moved into this location. Uh, and the, the unique thing about this is they have snow there. It very, 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 very seldom snows in the suburbs of Los Angeles. And this is one of those unique locations that they actually got snow there. Um, so my dad is the one farthest on the left, third one over, that's uh, his mother, my grandmother. And a, a lot of the family people worked for the company. And so a lot of times, you know, uh, different family members would work there at different times. Um, so at, a previous slide showed that the uh, post-war roll film adapter started in 1947. And after about four or five years, the market started getting saturated. Um, 35 millimeter cameras were coming into vogue at the time. And so sales were declining. So they said, we need to get into something else. And Ed was kind of captured and interested in model trains. 
And, um, and so 1951, they kind of repurposed all the machinery that they had purchased for the uh, roll film adapters and started doing model railroad kits. Uh, the thing that they did that was um, unique was they used corrugated metal for to simulate uh, metal sidings on buildings. Uh, it's the same metal that they used in, in making the roll film adapters. So a lot of the equipment, they just kind of repurposed it, got a couple of different dies and bought a couple extra pieces of, of machinery and they're able to get all this stuff. Now, when they first started off, two other companies. There was one company, uh, Tom Ayers. Um, and so if you ever see the name Tom Ayers, he was in the town of Garden Grove, which is right uh, other company that they bought out was in, in the city of Fresno, California, called Argy Specialty. And those two companies made uh, buildings and factories, but their primary uh, material that they used was cardboard. And so they used a big punch press that had a die in it and it would push down through the cardboard and boom, there's your sides, your, your ends, your roof, everything like that. So a lot of the uh, cardboard models were ones that they purchased from these two companies and all of the metal products, it was unique. The only company around that used tin plate as the uh, uh, modeling material. You had to learn how to solder. A lot of people go solder. And so along in the kits, there was instructions and a couple practice pieces of metal to, so you can work on your skills of learning how to solder. Uh, you could probably use uh, Walther's or some epoxy or something else, but um, solder is, is a fantastic um, joint if you, if you get it right. But uh, just like doing uh, brass work on a locomotive, you got it's a skill you've got to learn. So anyway, that, that started in 1951. And um, a couple of years later in 1956, they began to import uh, brass models from Japan. Um, Post-World War II, some of the craftsmen in Japan were selling little uh, kits on how to put stuff together to make kind of a somewhat locomotive type thing. And some of the early companies like PFM, you know, actually brought these in and uh, so starting in 1956, Ed was the first person to import large quantities of the of, uh, electrical interurbans or trolley cars. And, uh, you know, early brass imports were limited to onesies and twosies. A lot of them came painted and, and lettered and numbered for a specific locomotive. And they really weren't in a large production mode. But uh, he would, you know, order 100, 150, 200, 300 of a particular model, which was kind of unheard of at the time. So on the sheet here in the upper right hand corner, these are the, uh, the cars that, that just came out. Um, he picked a model that originally was built for the Portland Eugene and Eastern, um, a company that was a, owned by the Southern Pacific. And um, as use of these cars in Portland declined, the, the line basically uh, folded. All this rolling stock was extra. And so uh, Southern Pacific came to the Pacific Electric and says, we want you because they owned the Pacific Electric after 1911. Southern Pacific says, we want you to go to Portland and buy all this stuff. And they're going, why? You know, because we own you and we tell you what to do. And so they kind of go, oh, okay. So anyway, these cars ran in Portland. They looked a little different. They had to come to Los Angeles. They changed them around a little bit. But what Ed decided to do was pick a car that operated in two different railroads in two different cities to get people that modeled in, in both areas with a minimal of uh, difference in, in uh, machining and fabrication, you've got a couple of different uh, cars. And so over here on the left side, you see the Portland cars used uh, pantographs. They're on these little elevated tables so they can get up to the wire. Uh, 
the reason they did that is they operated on lines that also had steam locomotives. And so they had to get the wires up high enough so they didn't uh, electrocute brakemen or whatever. Over on the right-hand side, same car after they had been changed a little bit to operate in Los Angeles. And so we'll look at these in a little bit more detail, but those ended up being very popular. Some of the different cars or the products that were sold under the Saddam name. Uh, upper left here, these are some of the cardboard kits that uh, the other uh, companies, Ayers and Argy, uh, fabricated. You see these on eBay all the time. I looked at it this morning and there was probably 400 items, 400 Saddam items on eBay. So they're definitely moving around in the secondary market. Uh, below that is a model of a Pacific Electric uh, railway post office car. Um, they came unpainted, and so you have to paint them yourself. And this is a very, very good paint job that a friend of mine did. Um, the metal kits, uh, when fabricated, looked like this. This was, again, on eBay. And there was a number of different kits. So it was one, two, three, four different kits but they never got to the point of painting them. But uh, this is what they looked like when they were fabricated. And then in the kit itself, this shows you how the different parts are in there and the instructions on how to put it together. And then uh, Chicago North Shore, um, there was a, about six or seven cars imported for that particular line also, which you may be a little more familiar with. <clears throat> so kind of a little, little timeline of, of East Adam and Company and the Pacific Electric. Uh, so street railways came first, electric railways started in the late 1800s. 1901, the Pacific Electric was formed by Henry Huntington. Henry Huntington was the nephew of Collis P. Huntington, C.P. Huntington, one of the big four that uh, started the Central Pacific for the Transcontinental Railroad. You know, they were the Western portion of it and that later morphed into the Southern Pacific. So Henry Huntington used to work for the Southern Pacific and he uh, came down to Los Angeles around the turn of the century and he saw a lot of empty land and he saw a lot of opportunity to develop that land and make a lot of money. So he sold his interest in a railroad he owned in the San Francisco Bay Area, moved down here and started the Pacific Electric. Uh, so that started in 1901. Nine years later, only nine years later, he sold those interests to the Southern Pacific. Uh, because of stock purchases and other things, he was kind of forced into making this, uh, this sale. It was kind of almost a hostile takeover. But out of it, he got 100% control in another trolley system in Los Angeles called the Los Angeles Railway, the Larry. And the Southern Pacific got 100% control of the Pacific Electric. So um, one year later, the Southern Pacific merged eight different trolley systems into one system, what they called the new Pacific Electric. And the, and the reason I bring this particular thing up is in 1911, they came up with a, a letter, a numbering system for all the cars that pretty much lasted throughout the rest of the life of the Pacific Electric. And the models that I'm going to talk about, most of them use that post-1911 numbering system as, as the reference number. Uh, you know that sometimes when numbers change a lot, it gets kind of confusing. Uh, luckily, they didn't go through a lot of changes in the numbering system here. And they kind of had a master uh, way of, of doing that that I'll show you here in a second. So anyway, 1925, PE was at its largest. Um, it, during the World War II, uh, for the years following 1925, the system started to decline, decline in ridership, decline in new purchases of equipment, maintenance, mainly because people were getting cars and driving around themselves. You know, so it was during that time you started seeing this migration to cars instead of um, rail transit. So World War II, gas was restricted. People couldn't drive their cars that they had. And so they were forced into riding the system and tons of usage during World War II. Uh, cars, trolley cars that were planned to be demolished, all of a sudden send it into the shops, refurbish it, let's use it. 
uh, whatever it takes, let's get it back out there and haul people or freight around as needed. Um, so um, after the war, 1947, East Adam and Company started. And so the PE is still going at this time. Uh, so 1951, uh, some of the branch lines, some of the fingers out on the system started getting cut off, that uh, they were abandoning service in some of these areas. Also in 51 is when Saddam started in the hobby portion. Uh, in 1953, uh, PE sold uh, their interests in running the passenger portion of the system to Metropolitan Coach Lines. Uh, they still retained ownership of a lot of the trackage. They still retained uh, a lot of the freight because the freight was very profitable for them. There were four big railroads in the Los Angeles area, the Southern Pacific, the Union Pacific, the Santa Fe, and the Pacific Electric. Of all four of them, the Pacific Electric had the greatest number of uh, origins of freight movement. You know, it beat out those other ones, hands down. Uh, it's because when Huntington came in, he had areas that he actually developed into freight districts. You know, they have all the yards going in there. And so they, they generated a lot of money for, for the railroad. So anyway, 1956, first brass car. Um, and then 1977, the last model was imported. And a couple of years later, it was in about 84, uh, Saddam went out of business, uh, sold, sold the business to, um, Another, another person who continued it on. So anyway, this is the Pacific Electric System. Uh, this one's kind of neat because it uh, shows where everything is. They had over a thousand miles of track. They had 2,700 trains a day. So it was really, really big. And so this was around that time in the mid 1920s that uh, this, this was happening. So, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the first models that came in were models of the uh, Portland car. Over on the left side, this is Portland, Eugene, and Eastern. It's a little bit better quality photo. You can see what's going on. Uh, when these cars came to the Pacific Electric, they got rid of the pantograph. They put trolley poles on there. They put overhead destination signs. Neat thing about these cars, they had overhead uh, or the upper sash windows was actually made out of stained glass. And so it's kind of a little air of uh, ritziness there. So these are the first cars that were uh, imported, uh, slight variation. So you had two cars, you had a coach, you had a combination car that had a small baggage section. Uh, and then uh, you, they had them configured for the Portland uh, car and then the revised Pacific Electric car. And so that first production run of all these different uh, cars was totaling 730 units. Big gamble at the time. And um, Ed's cost of buying these things from the manufacturer, they were selling them to him for about $10 a car. And everybody goes, $10? Wow. Right now, these same cars are going for close to $200 a piece on eBay. If they're nice cars, if they're rare ones, if they're nicely painted, they'll go for a lot more than that. So kind of the, the big numbers here, how many, how many uh, brass trolleys did Ed import in total? Almost 45,000 cars. It's a lot. Uh, of those, almost 27,000 of them were Pacific Electric prototypes. And so, you know, it was a significant part of the market there. Uh, the biggest year was 1969 with almost 5,000 cars being brought in with, with the number of different production runs. Um, so in any given year, they would have as little as only 150 cars imported up to almost 5,000. Production runs of a particular model were as small as 50 cars, but as big as maybe 800 cars in a particular run. Um, 
there was one particular freight locomotive that out of about six different runs uh, was almost 1900 cars that were imported. Um, there were four variations of the 1200 cars, 3500 units that came in. Uh, at the time that they were originally sold, they sold for about 20 bucks. So he would buy them for about 10. They would sell retail in the, in the stores for about 20. As time went on, those prices went up 35, 39, 40, 50, uh, and some as high as $75 per. Um, there were some of the um, 16 wheel drive locomotives that were used on the Milwaukee and in uh, Illinois terminal uh, that sold new for about $150. They were very complex, had a lot of gears and drive wheels and stuff. So some of those uh, were very expensive at the time. And now, you know, just looking at them, you know, you're going to be paying $300, $400 for those particular cars. So they're very expensive. Um, okay, so here's, here's a picture of one of the first cars that was imported. This was one of the Portland coaches. It's all windows. Uh, the Portland cars had round windows on the end. This particular one, there was 150 of this particular model. That was in 56. The very last unit to go out was in 1977, which was a model of a railway post office car, uh, 600 units. And it, it was kind of an obscure little car, but it was kind of weird that so many units were fabricated and imported of a relatively unusual car. A lot of times you'll, you'll uh, try to sell a lot of the same thing. If they're going to run in a train of three, four, maybe five cars, then yeah, you okay, let's sell a couple hundred of these uh, to the wholesaler. But uh, this was uh, a very nicely fabricated car, nicely made, ran great. Uh, the labels on the boxes, everybody would recognize the yellow box and the red label on the end. So that was a very distinguishing feature of the ESADAM product line. So here we're going to go through and take a look at the prototype and the model. So here's an example of the one of those uh, freight locomotives and one of the six different production runs of, of that locomotive. So I previously mentioned about uh, the numbering system after 1911. And so they came up with this numbering system. Um, cars between one and 399 were city cars, 400 to 699 were suburban, light in urban service, 700 to 1299 were heavy in urban cars, the big ones. Um, 1300 series were kind of reserved for combination cars. And so a lot of times you'll have a combination car that pairs up with one of the light or heavy and urban cars, you know, that they were fabricated to the same mechanism, same electronic system, but they just said, okay, we're gonna take a couple of these cars and turn them into uh, combos. Uh, the 1400 series were box motors and some of the railway post office cars. Uh, 1500 series were light locomotives or switching locomotives. Uh, 1600 series, those were the heavy locomotives. 17 were line cars for maintenance. Um, 1800 were miscellaneous ones and, and the wreckers uh, followed an SP pro, uh, practice of using double O at the beginning to uh, distinguish certain types of maintenance of way type cars. Okay, so here's, here's the Huntington Standard. Huntington Standard was a city car, uh, had an open section on both ends, enclosed section in the middle Thing that was unique about Huntington cars on the PE is you had a five window front with curved glass windows on the corners. Uh, this was an older numbering system that uh, didn't follow the 1911 yet. So that's why the, the numbers are kind of, kind of unique. Here's the model of that car and it captures all the same stuff. Now this particular car had the drive line run under the floorboard. Uh, you've got this open area where you want to show off the seats. 
you know, the motor is kind of sticking up here. You've got to remember that this is all before CAN motors came along. So you had a lot of open frame, big bulky motors, but uh, they were able to kind of disguise it as best they could run uh, a spring drive, drive line to one of the trucks. The, the passenger cars like this always only had one truck powered. They didn't do both because they're not pulling the train or anything, they're just pulling themselves. So this was the um, Huntington Standard. Um, cars that were used on the Pacific Electric and all over the United States was what they called the Bernie safety car as certain marginal lines were being considered for abandonment uh, because they just weren't bringing in a profit or as much of a profit as they wanted. A lot of the companies wanted to get rid of uh, the, the line entirely. <clears throat> but the, this company came along and says, tell you what, we got the answer for you. We've got these little cars here that they're four wheels. They're very light. They don't beat up the track as much as the big cars do. Only takes one man to operate. Whereas all the other trolleys, you had the motorman, you had the conductor who picked up the fares. So you cut your, your labor costs in half. You cut, uh, your maintenance costs are gonna go way down. You're not beating up this. It's a little car. It draws a lot less electricity. So the, the railroad said, this is great. And Pacific Electric bought a bunch of them. A lot of other companies all around the country bought these little, uh, they referred to them as cootie cars. Only problem, very light car, very terrible suspension. They bounced all over the place like crazy. People didn't like riding in these cars. So what eventually would happen is these would go as long as they could, then they would swap them out for buses. And a lot of times the Pacific Electric had their own bus system that they uh, replaced them with. The model of the, of the Birdie safety car is kind of unique. It does not show up in any of the catalogs that Sedan put out. You know, they, they would put out catalogs for everything. These cars were never in there. What, uh, what happened, I think, was there was a uh, jobber in Japan that built a bunch of these on spec, which means on the speculation that somebody will buy them. And so there was about eight different, let me see, about eight different uh, American companies that imported these cars. And when you look at them, they are exactly the same. The car body, the way the roof vents are, uh, the doors, the windows, the rivets, everything is exactly the same, except the motor. There was three different variations on how the motor was mounted. One was horizontal. Uh, the sedan Bernies, they were on a diagonal. And then there was another one that had the motor on a vertical shaft. And one other thing is this one shows two trolley poles on top. There was another version that had a single trolley pole. So, but basically <clears throat> uh, this shows you when all of those were imported. It was mostly the ones during the 1960s from 61 until 69. They all looked exactly the same. And so it shows you that they were imported by Saddam, LMB, Kid Kidder. Jim, uh, MTS, Fairfield, Soho. Uh, now the one here in 84, I don't think was, was this particular uh, car. I think they, by that time they got a little bit better product. The problem was these cars, very light in weight. So you didn't have a lot of weight on the drive axle. One drive axle was powered. The other one was floating. And so it, it, the wheels slipped a whole bunch and it, it, was, it was terrible. It had a small motor and it would crank out at very high RPMs and it would be screaming as it's going down the track. It, it was terrible. It was a terrible car. Um, a lot of people found that they can swap this out with uh, something like a uh, PDT uh, thing that used to be manufactured by Northwest Shortline and the other little four wheels. I don't know if the Stanton makes uh, wheel diameters this small. There was a company in Australia called uh, Hollywood Foundry that used to make a drop-in replacement power truck for this. You know, just take out the old one, put in the new one. Um, unfortunately, that company went out of business because of uh, health reasons. 
Uh, but he had some really great replacement uh, power trucks for, for different things. Okay, moving along, more city cars. This was a uh, the only uh, cars built by the Niles Company that the Pacific Electric had. They bought them used from a, a railroad in San Diego. Niles liked using these arch windows, which was kind of their one of their signature thing. On the end here, these windows are square because this was originally an open air section. It had mesh siding down here. And so that's why these look different than the center portion. There was only like about six or seven of these cars uh, in operation. And they typically were in some of the more rural locations. They operated in single car trains. <clears throat> uh, and so this is what the car looks like when it was painted. And again, you've got the uh, motor down under the floorboard and the drive line going to it so that you don't see this big bulky motor in the middle here. This particular car was acquired from one of the eight railroads that was consolidated in that big purchase. And this car was actually built in the company shops, the Los Angeles and Redondo Beach Railroad. Uh, was owned by a lumberman uh, and had a lot of very skilled craftsmen in the <clears throat> woodworking area. And so they built these cars, beautiful looking cars, nice arched windows. Even the windows on the end were arched. Uh, very few cars from these other companies that were acquired actually survived into the post-1911 uh, process. Uh, but this was one of the ones that was very substantial. This particular one would run up into a canyon up behind Pasadena. Right next to it, there was a cable incline right next to it. So the passengers would get out, get into the cable, go to the top of the mountain. They would get out and get into a narrow gauge uh, car and they would run back into the mountains at about an elevation of 5,000 feet to a kind of a luxury resort up in the mountains at the time. It was, it was really, really neat trip uh, for people to take. And here is a photo of that particular model. Uh, it's just a really nice looking little car. A lot of times these cars would try to be very good, very close uh, representations of the prototype. <clears throat> Some of the early cars um, that were made out of brass uh, or represented a steel carving had the rivets embossed from the backside, uh, where, whereas in later times, they uh, started using the photo etching process to create the details on the brass models. But early on, a lot of them were, uh, were pressed the rivets in. Also, your, your hand railings and other, other things were a little bit oversized. Uh, they were bulletproof though. Uh, in later years, some other manufacturers imported cars that went more to scale but the thing is, you grab onto it, you bend the thing and breaks things off. And so they're a little more delicate. But uh, these cars were really, really built well. Some of the things you can also do is tell by the, the wheels. If it was nickel silver, it was during the middle or later production. Early production cars had brass. Uh, they had sharp flanges. They didn't follow the RP25 uh, code that uh, the NMRA does in one of their recommended practices. Um, a lot of the cars have omitted details on, on the roof. Uh, and a lot of times the things that are gonna be up on the roof of the car would be air hoses. There was a air hose that would come up from the end of the car and a little valve here that would go up here. The, the PE cars had these cylinders up on top that <clears throat> if, the, if the pole came off the wire and went up, they could get it to retract uh, with the air pressure in, in the um, cylinder there. And then there's the electrical cables coming from the pole base to a fuse box that's on the roof. And then from there, it would go to some place where the power would go down inside a wall, down to where the motors and all the control mechanisms are underneath. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that's, that's missing as far as details. Um, The five car here was the first uh, 
cars ordered by Pacific Electric when they first started. They wanted to get um, high-speed interurban type runs. But at the time that they started in 1901, all the railroads, all the interurban lines in Los Angeles were narrow gauge, 42 inch width. That was the standard. 600 volt overhead wire, <clears throat> that was the standard. So what Huntington says, I need to get a bigger motor on that truck and it's just not gonna fit into a 42 inch space. So he says, I'm gonna make everything standard gauge. Put a bigger motor in there, get higher speeds, get more horsepower, get 50, 75, 100, 100 horsepower <clears throat> per motor. And so this was the first of the inner urban cars. It's, it's in the suburban category, but uh, it's the first one that came along that says, we're gonna, we're gonna be treating this like a, like a big time railroad. And so the, if you take a look at this, you'll notice there's a three window open section, no windows there. And again, originally there was just wire mesh in this area. Later they, they put um, wood siding in here. These cars would get up and do about 60 miles an hour. So can you consider the people sitting in the open section at 60 miles an hour? <clears throat> it was kind of crazy. They put in some heavy duty curtains that would kind of come down. They put in the wood siding here, but it was still an open section. It didn't have windows, uh, but these, these were like the first step in that direction. So the open section, you had even spaced windows. The enclosed section, you had one large window and a couple pairs and single windows in that section. <clears throat> and a number of the uh, subsequent orders kind of followed that basic pattern, but just bigger and bigger on each order. Uh, these are one of the later production models, a lot of great detail. I know modelers are not supposed to say it, but this is a cute car. It, it operates great, it looks great, and, and it, it's just cute. It's very tiny compared to other ones. Let me um, get one of my models. I got all my models out here behind me. Um, so here's, here's a model of the 500 class. Let me see if I can get it here. And this is the same uh, design basically on the 1000 series. And as you can see, they just did the same thing, but made it a lot bigger. So they look about the same on the ends. They look about the same on the side, but just more windows, more length. Uh, and so that was a, the start of kind of a standard design they used for the wooden cars. Another series of cars, which was probably the biggest number of cars, probably about 150, 160 cars in this particular class was what they referred to as the Hollywood cars. If anybody saw Who Framed Roger Rabbit, this was the car that was in the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Of course, the, what they used in the movie was, um, it was on wheels, on truck wheels, it wasn't real rail, <clears throat> but this was the, the car. Um, because they had so many cars in this system, they had to take the heavy inner urbans that were originally numbered in the 700 series and move them to the 950 numbering series. So they make more room for these cars in a, in a sequential numbering system of the 600s. <clears throat> these cars were probably the most popular cars are most well known and recognized mainly because they ran down Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood Boulevard uh, in Tinseltown. Here's a model. There was a couple variations of this model. This was the more modern version that had this skirting added. The earlier version, um, yeah, we don't see it here. Earlier version didn't have as much skirting, didn't have the fancy stripes on, on the paint scheme either. It was just a one color and different color on the roof. <clears throat> when, the, when the 500 series got enlarged, they created what was called the 800 series. And so this was basically just a stretched out version of the five. Um, and this is what the model looks like. 
they came in a couple of different variations. One of the models actually has the end open with the, with the mesh. Uh, this is the enclosed. They came originally with a single trolley pole. They uh, later put two trolley poles in there so it could operate inside of a subway so it could go in and come back out so you wouldn't have to finagle on flipping the uh, trolley pole around inside of a confined space. The cars that were originally in the 700 series that got renumbered into the 950 series were the Venice cars. Again, these were, these were some cars that were acquired from one of those eight companies on the west side of Los Angeles that went out to Santa Monica the, uh, on the ocean. <clears throat> these were very similar <coughs> to the 800 series car. Only difference is they were not controlled or influenced by the five window front Huntington design. They had their own design. They had three regular windows, but you look at the side, it looks very similar to an 800 series car. And here's a model, very great car. Uh, there were probably about three or four different production runs of this one. This one was one of the last ones, which had a lot of nice details. You can see that the they got little fine mesh uh, brass behind the, the steps. Uh, the hold downs for the trolley poles here were actually sprung to keep them uh, secured into this. So this was a really nicely uh, built model. The 10 series cars, the one I just showed you a little bit ago, the 1000, this one right here is in the middle of the Hollywood freeway. As the Hollywood freeway got built, they st stuck the trolley cars in the middle of the freeway. Well, at the time, this was the end of the Hollywood freeway. If cars came up here, they made a sharp left-hand turn, crossed the train tracks and <coughs> went over to a city street. If anybody has ever come to California, uh, these hills in the background is where Universal Studios is. So there's uh, definitely a little bit of difference in the area. This is a model of the 10, which it looks like that five, but just a lot bigger. One of the cars they made into a business car. They uh, just uh, stretched down the windows, uh, put a couple of bathrooms in the middle of the car. See the original 10s over here had bathrooms in the corners. Uh, and the reason for that is they were designed to run on a 60 mile <coughs> line that went from Los Angeles to San Bernardino. And they had to provide bathrooms on these cars. So these actually had bathrooms on the opposite corners. And so on the business car here, they did the same thing, but they moved the bathroom a little more towards the middle of the car. In 1913, there was a very bad car accident involving two wooden trains. One, one car telescoped inside another car. A lot of people injured, a lot of people killed. PE said, we are never going to buy another wooden car again. <clears throat> the only thing was they didn't say we we're going to get rid of our wooden cars because that was 1913. And through World War II, 1943, 44, 45, the wooden cars were still being used. So yeah, it wasn't that much of an urgency to them, I guess. But what happened after that is they decided to go with steel cars. And this is one of the cars series, the 1100 series, uh, that was the answer for that. There's a model for this. Um, this is a, um, for people that are rivet counters, this is a perfect example of of a car where you should look at the rivets. Uh, as I said, those earlier production models had brass wheels. So this has got a brass wheel. You look at the, the uh, ladder that's up here on the roof, it's just kind of a stamped <coughs> metal strip. The other thing is the rivets on the side of the car here is a single row. Whereas the prototype, uh, kind of hard to see the prototype there was actually double rows of rivets on the cars. So this was kind of a boo-boo at the time and, and subsequent model production runs that used uh, the photo etching process got the rivets correct. 
So if you're a rivet counter, this is one of those ones that, yeah, okay. Next series was the 1200 series. Um, the 1200 series was basically the, the steel version of a 10. And, and the 10s were designed to operate on a special uh, line that upped the voltage from 600 to 1200 volts. So when the trains got in that section, they flipped a couple switches and they operated on 1200 volts until they got to the city at the far end, then they switch it back down. The 1200s were also part of that group that <coughs> could operate on the 1200 volt system. And so these were known as San Bernardino 12s. The reason for the San Bernardino is because that was the run that they had to have the bathrooms. On the steel cars, they put these oval windows in the bathroom area. To try to lure people back into the cars, they kind of gave them a, put a lipstick on a pig, um, made it look pretty. They put orange stripes and silver stripes and butterfly stripes and wings on the front. And these got the nickname of the butterfly 12s. So these are very rare models. Um, I've got two of them. I've got a powered version and an unpowered version. A lot of times they would import uh, the same car that represented a powered car, but they just wouldn't have a motor in here because the idea was that you pair one of these up with a powered car. Uh, the price of the car would be maybe $5 less, uh, but when you're buying it at $20 and you can get the unpowered version for 15, that's 25% savings. So I'd be, yeah, okay, I'll give me a powered one and an unpowered one. So this is what the uh, the model looks like of the, 12 there. Second group of the 12s were called Long Beach 12s. They went from Los Angeles down to the seaside of Long Beach. Uh, these cars looked almost dead exactly the same as the San Bernardino 12s with the bathrooms. Only on this car, there was no bathroom. That oval window was not a part of this design. So these cars, very similar, very similar. Um, what they did on the Long Beach line is they actually made the prototypes of uh, some of the unpowered trailers. And their idea was to have two powered cars and one unpowered car to hopefully save on electrical costs. It was a fairly flat ride from LA to Long Beach. <clears throat> and so what they did is they changed the gearing a little bit so that they could accelerate with, with the less power that they had. So they had a little bit lower top speed, but uh, this was modeled and you don't have any of the pole stuff on the top and you have a lot less of the electrical stuff on the bottom. But the, but the prototypes, these cars actually had controls inside so you could run them in a train. And you could actually have this as your lead car in a train of other 12s. <clears throat> Portland car. The, the one that was imported as the very first car was unique in that it had these round windows on the end. Uh, very easy to tell the Portland 12s, round windows, diagonal handlebar here, and roof vents that were uh, round compared to all the other ones. And again, it has the stained glass windows in the upper portion here. So these are the Portland 12s. And here's the model of it. And they came with, um, green acetate to kind of represent that stained glass configuration. <clears throat> so here's, here's a picture of one of the, <coughs> excuse me, getting kind of dry here. Ah. So one of the early cars, like I said, they use these really kind of oversized uh, wire for it, but they were bulletproof. They lasted pretty good. And some of these earlier ones, you know, still could run nice and smooth. Then there was a, uh, a car that they, they needed. There was the wooden 1000 car that was the business car. Well, as Time came along, they started getting all these steel cars, all the management at the company says, gee, we need a steel business car. <clears throat> so what they did is they took one of the cars, ran it through the shops and they came out with this. Beautiful photograph 
Oh, love this. This is this is great. And for anybody that's on the um, uh, Facebook page, this is their banner picture, uh, which came from my collection that I got from my uncle. Um, I got about uh, 700 slides of different different things that uh, have been scanned and are in, in archives at the Mount Low Historical uh, Society's place in Pasadena. So here's, here's the model of that car. Blimps. Uh, two other railroads, the Southern Pacific owned up in the Bay Area around San Francisco. Uh, the Northwestern Pacific and the uh, Oakland Alameda lines had two different versions of cars that were gigantic. They, they, they were extra wide. They would have seating three and two. So you'd have five people across in the seating because of this extra width. They were very long. <clears throat> um, and so these came down to Los Angeles during World War II to help move people. And uh, PE eventually picked up on a lot of those. Well, the, uh, this is the coach that was, that was modeled. Uh, very nice car. There was an early version and a late version. If you're looking to pick them up, get the late version, better quality model. <clears throat> the numbering system on the blimps, uh, let me back up here, didn't follow that 1911 numbering system. The, these were in the 300 and 400 series, which was supposed to be a city car, but this ain't no city car. Um, same thing with the PCC cars. They numbered these in the 5000 series. There was nothing close to 5000, so I don't know why they picked that number to, for this. But um, state State uh, Public Utilities Commission forced the Pacific Electric to buy PCC cars. A lot of other railroads up across the country were already buying these, which looked like um, streamlined buses, but just on, on steel track. <clears throat> so anyway, the, the Pacific Electric PCC cars were unique in that they were double-ended. Two poles, they had controls on both ends, where most other PCC cars were single-ended. Uh, the ones that are manufactured by Bowser are single ended. And for those types of cars, at the end of the line, you needed to have a loop to turn the car around. With this, if you, uh, with these PCC cars, you got to the end of the line, the controller just goes to the other end, put, puts up the other pole, puts down the other pole, good to go. We don't need to run it through a loop. <clears throat> and this is the model. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the model really falls short of the history of the car. It's a very simplistic uh, bit of metalwork, and the the power system inside sucks. It it really is bad. It's uh, got a small motor. the The drive system, the universal, is actually just a piece of uh, metal tubing with a couple of cuts in the end. It's got a little tower gear arrangement here where the power is transmitted down to the wheels <clears throat> with these gears that break all the time. And, and it's, they're just noisy. Just like the little Bernie car, noisy, terrible. <clears throat> what I did is I went, um, Bowser sells a replacement PCC drive uh, for the trolley cars that they sell. And so I got the same thing, built it, uh, built a new frame, made it a little bit longer. And so operates great. It's, it's, a, it's a great runner. <clears throat> This particular car, um, somebody went and made a rubber mold of it and they sell uh, epoxy models, copies of this car. And I, I literally copied, they, I talked to the guy that did it and they actually took one of the sedan cars, created their mold and that's what they use to make all these other cars. It's a uh, Funaroo and Camerlingo, however you pronounce that. Uh, and they sell them for 20 bucks or something like that. <clears throat> Combination cars, 1300 series. Um, you have a, a small area to carry freight and um, area for passengers. This is in those, those re remote locations where it wouldn't be advisable to have a separate box motor and a separate freight car. A lot of times they'll carry light uh, freight, you know, like Railway Express, they'll carry <clears throat> Um, newspapers from uh, the big uh, 
know, newspaper companies that carry them out to the newsstands. A lot of times newspapers at that time would have multiple editions. They'd have a morning edition, a midday edition, and a late uh, evening edition, you know, because news changed during the day. And so they were constantly uh, taking newspapers out to these um, stands. And this is one of the neatest looking cars. I really like, like the way this is. And this was the combination that went along with that car that came up from San Diego, the, uh, the Niles car. What, what they did is they, the, the Niles cars were going to be scrapped. But when it got to the shop, one of the guys says, I like that car. I'm going to turn it into a couple. So they kind of did a sneaky on management and they converted one of the cars into this combination when it really should have been scrapped. <clears throat> um, 1360 series, these are the combinations that are equivalent to the 10 series cars. And this is one of those cars right here. Um, they would put the combination in what was the open window or the open window section of the car. Steel cars even had a combination that were equivalent. The 1100 series never had a combination, but uh, two of the 12 series, the San Bernardino 12 on the left side here, this was the combination equivalent to the San Bernardino 12 cars. On the right here, this is the combination equivalent to the Portland 12 cars. The Long Beach 12 cars never had a, um, a combination equivalent. They just had uh, the powered cars and a couple of the trailers. <clears throat> so here is the um, 1370 series, the equivalent of the San Bernardino car. And here is the prototype of the Portland car. Theirs was very small. They had a narrow door and only one window. That was it. That was the whole uh, baggage section, just two windows. Whereas the this car here, probably a third of the car uh, had room for baggage. But it was a very unique looking little car. And this is the model of it. The blimps even had their own uh, combination cars. There was about four uh, on the prototype. And um, these, these cars often went down to the port of uh, San Pedro. And so sometimes they'd be coming back carrying fish in the, in the baggage section, freshly caught fish. And here's the model of that particular car. 1400 series had a um, railway post office car. This, this particular photo was after it retired and was in company service. Company service cars were painted brown, a mineral brown color. Uh, cars that were in service uh, were painted the red color. And so this is when it was a railway post office and did railway express agency type work. Uh, here's a steel car that's an RPO that uh, same thing, it's in red. Uh, and this particular photo was out in the San Bernardino area. <clears throat> this is the model of that particular car, the 1406. Uh, very rare model, very few of them were produced, only, only one production run. Uh, 1407 was kind of an oops. One of the, uh, there was only three of those, those other cars that um, were available for the three mail runs. And the mail runs would do two or maybe three loops of the area they would have to go to. Well, one of the cars was, was demolished in an accident. And so they had to quickly go and find another car. So they ripped out all the, uh, the uh, post office type equipment, you know, those little cubby holes that they would sort the mail in. They'd have a guy in there, you know, do, sorting the mail as they would go down the tracks. Um, so what they did is they took another Portland car, they played it over the windows, put the, uh, mail stuff in there and, and kind of did a quickie uh, mail car. So that was the 1407. And this is the model of that particular car. And you can see where the windows would were to be plated over. Uh, and then they cut in the large doors, small doors, and the smaller windows, got rid of the stairs that came up and just replaced it with straps. <clears throat> One of the cars that came down from Portland was a box motor. They these box motors were uh, uh, 
for carrying less than carload freight. In other words, if you couldn't fill up a box car, put it in one of these box motors. And they would, they would do basically the same thing as FedEx and UPS. They were limited to hauling only one freight car. Uh, they says, if you do more than that, by union agreement, you've got to have a full crew. And they go, no, we want to have one guy, one, one motorman. They go, well, if you want to do that, you've got to call this a switching locomotive. And so they put footboards on the end of it and they limit it to only carrying one freight car. Again, this is a very rare model um, and it's a neat looking car. PE built their own uh, box motors in wood. This particular uh, box motor was built to be dual voltage also, ran on the 600 and the 1200 volt system. And so uh, this is what the car looked like before they put footboards on the end of it, still had this. Uh, so this is the 1451 series. Uh, let me see. During World War II, they needed more and more box motors. So again, they went to their, uh, all those Portland cars that they were forced to buy uh, by the Southern Pacific. <coughs> and they found some that were kind of in good shape. And they said, okay, let's plate over the windows and and cut in some doors and create a, a box motor. This one, they did it so fast, they didn't even remove the stained glass windows up on top. They just plated over the lower portion of the windows and left the stained glass up on top. So this was kind of a, a quickie during World War II. And here's the model unpainted. Even the blimps had their version of box motors. These were the biggest ones, gigantic. They were just really big. And here's the model of that. The light locomotives, there was only one that uh, Saddam imported. There was a number of them, but they were all kind of weird little mismatched uh, things from the previous railroads. This one here actually came down from San Francisco. Um, they took the tenders of a couple of steam locomotives, uh, the sloping tenders, put them on the back here, filled them with ballast to give the thing a lot more weight. This particular locomotive was such a juice hog that it slowed all the other cars in a particular division. And, and so they says, you know, we can't have you running here because it hurts everything else. And so they restricted it to only do switching at nighttime when the other lines weren't running. <coughs> Here's a model. Um, the locomotives, this particular locomotive was never painted red like this. This was donated to a city of Los Angeles, put in a park and somebody in the park department says, let's paint it red. Well, it wasn't correct, it wasn't the right color. It should have been painted either black or brown. Okay, here's a heavy locomotive. We showed a picture of it earlier. The, these were very similar to an off the shelf Baldwin uh, class D locomotive. So these could have been seen all over the country for a lot of different roads. Maybe a few of the details a little bit different, but uh, this was a very, um, considering everything else was kind of custom built, these were kind of more off the shelf. Uh, the first order came from Baldwin. They wanted to get as another order and so they let it out to bid. And actually the, the repair shop, the PE repair shop in Torrance underbid Baldwin and they fabricated fabricated an exact replica of the Baldwin locomotives uh, uh, at a cheaper price. And this is the model here. Um, this was a tower car that would uh, maintenance crews would operate on. But what they did is they would put a, on this particular one, they would put a little grease stick on here. So instead of using wheels on the pole, they would have little sliders that would uh, slide on the wire. And so they would put a, uh, mixture of paraffin and graphite to basically grease uh, the wires so that they wouldn't wear out uh, the pole or the wire. And here's a model. These are, these are very popular on eBay. You know, there's one on there and it's, it's going for like almost $300. It's not even painted. Uh, but if you ever get this, this has got one of those problems with those plastic gears Plastic gears, they shrink, they crack, and they lock up and they, and they won't turn. So if, you, if you're looking for any of the models that have the plastic gears, 
test run it. Take a close look to see if the gears are broken. Okay, this is one of the 1451 box motors. Um, because it was built to run on the dual voltage, they needed something to work on the overhead. So they took one of the cars and they said, okay, let's do 00157. Uh, the double O means certain kind of maintenance type work. Had a little tower platform here that could extend up so they could work on the overhead wires. Uh, there was this generic work car, kind of looked like early, uh, early flat motors, but it's not really a Pacific Electric, but it was uh, just kind of generic. And uh, the last car I want to talk about here is the Saddam car that never, that almost never was. True. This car was in production uh, in about 1983, uh, 84, something like that. Before it was delivered, Ed sold the business and uh, See, my dad and my, my uncle had split the, the business in two. So my, my dad was like a sub subcontractor to Ed. <clears throat> so Ed had the business primarily in his name. <coughs> and around 1984, he sold it. And um, these cars had yet to be delivered. The guy that bought the business did not want to do any of the importing. So what Ed did is he went to Fred Hill of the original uh, whistle stop in Pasadena. So Fred said, I'll take these cars. So he, he brought them in, he turned them around, sold them under his own name. But uh, this was probably a good uh, eight years after the previous model, fantastic detail work. You know, the, the, the trucks were great, the top, everything. And this was the only car that would have had a can motor. Everything else had, um, had open frame motors. And I had one of these, I, I sold it, but it, it operated great. So that's, that's kind of it as far as history, the what, the where, and the, what, the why fours and, uh, of the company. Um, I worked for my dad for a number of years when I was young. When I was going to college, I needed some extra money. I worked for Ed in his shop, uh, mainly because it was closer to where I was going to college. <clears throat> so I've been kind of working on both, both ends of it. When I decided a career path, I said, I'm not gonna do hobby products. You know, they're too up and down based on the economy. Economy's up, people have supplemental money. Yeah, great. Economy's terrible. It's it's dead. It's dead. And so uh, I opted to go civil service. Any questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, uh, just unmute yourself, and uh, you can ask the uh, the question in that. I'm sure that uh, the, the subject matter of Pacific Electric may have not have been uh, everybody's uh, preferred railroad, but the thing is, um, there's a lot of modeling in there that you could uh, apply to any any particular route. Uh, what I what I found fascinating was the the early history of the uh, the company and uh, that was the first I've ever seen of the the film camera adapter and. Uh, you know, it's they they would do a couple other weird little job things. Um, have you ever seen um, uh, the um, Big Bang Theory? Okay. Okay, and they work at a, a this place. Well, it's basically Caltech, California Institute of Technology in, in Pasadena. Well, Isadam and Company got a contract with Caltech to make rabbit cages. And so they had spot welding thing. And so they fabricated these rabbit cages to be used in their, in the um, um, uh, laboratories where they would, I don't know, dissect the rabbits or use their blood or something like that. But uh, that was kind of one of the weird things that, uh, that they did as far as, you know, side, 
side orders, you know, it's these rabbit cages. Okay, I see Billy got your your hand up. I don't know if you had a question here. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. I have a couple questions. Hey, Norm, great talk. Um, I, 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 it's interesting that 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 on the model runs, the models changed, and I suppose if 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 you've got a real good eye, you could figure out you could figure out the different the different model runs. I, um, the Washington, Baltimore, and Annapolis car. I, I, I've, I've got a couple and. It seems like the early one was assembled or, di or assembled in a different manner. The, the uh, later ones are so much more um, uh, better, better made you know, with fewer parts. And it's, it's easier to put together. So I was just wondering how, how, that, how that came along. Um, hold on a second. Let me get a book here. A lot of the information that I garnered came from this the brown book okay is anybody okay. familiar with the brown book yes i am yes okay yeah a lot of information in here and a lot of the information dealing with the sedan models uh actually fred hill the, the guy from the original whistle stop provided that information into this book so fred knew a lot of the information on this the the good thing about this is is it lists who the manufacturer was. And so what you're gonna probably find out is in those two different production runs, it may have been a different manufacturer. There were seven different companies in Japan that made the different products. Some of them did only, two of the companies only did one model. The early guys, the, the bulletproof ones, a company called Sabomi, they did 57 different production runs. And uh, you had a couple other ones did things here and there, those underfloor drives. And the last company that did about 27, um, 27 production runs was Orion. If you can find an Orion model, they're the best. Very good okay. quality. Okay. So, so on your model, you know, if you can get a hold of the Brown book and take a look at it, you, you can look at the bottom side and kind of see the way it's put together. And uh, there's other little clues that kind of tells you who the manufacturer is. It's just, like I said, these, these were literally fabricated in, in people's houses in Japan. Some of the people that said they've gone to Sabomi's thing, they were literally on the kitchen table putting these things together. How did, how did Ed find these uh, manufacturers? Did he, uh, did he go to Japan? See, I, I had this illusion in my head that he's flying into Japan every every couple of years and he's talking to people and he's going down the street and finding someone. Did he have the plans? I, I thought he had the like the drawings, the blueprints under his arm. And he'd say, um, uh, Ed never traveled to Japan. He was one of wow. the few importers that never went over there. But wow. the people in Japan would come over here and talk oh. to him. Oh, okay. okay. And so what he would use to give them a set of plans is he would, he would find some kind of plans that were done in a model railroad magazine. There was all the erection drawings that were in the uh, uh, cars of the Pacific Electric. Uh, great, great job of documenting all the cars of the Pacific Electric. So he would give them those and he would kind of pencil over it or pen over it saying, here's where the motor's going to go. Here's where the drive line's going. Here's the pivot point. And so a lot of this stuff was kind of a early version of saying, this is the way we're going to get there. And a lot of times what they would do is um, partway through production, they would um, send a kind of a in progress model over saying, this is what we're going to do. We're, a lot of the details aren't quite there yet. But this is what it's 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 looking like. I, hold on a second here. A lot of times, uh, a lot of importers would refer to those as pilot models. Exactly, and and this is one of those pilot models for the for the trolley cars. They didn't have a lot of the details on here, and, and so this this particular car here, it's, I've got it primed and in in the process of painting it, is is one of those models that was in progress and, and it's at that point they say oh you got it backwards the door should be on the other side and all that kind of stuff but um there was one model that was produced i think it was a hollywood car 
It was so crappy. He refused <laughs> to accept it. He refused to, but somebody else picked it up and sold it. Yeah, yeah, we'll sell it. <laughs> it's like crap. Uh, there was a company called Model Engineering Works, MEW, which was kind of just the next city over from where Ed was. Oh, they they didn't like each other. And, and he was the guy that picked up these cars and, and still sold them. But anyway, not everybody was happy. But as far as your your production on those those cars, I don't know specifics because I'm, I'm not familiar with a lot of the other cars uh, that uh, you've got. I've only got a couple of... Um, got a Sacramento Northern car and an Oregon electric car. And um, I've got the Brill uh, gas, uh, gas motor. Uh, but a, a lot of the Midwest stuff I, I, I don't have, so I couldn't give you specifics on that. I, I always laugh at the headlights. The early cars didn't have the headlights. And then it seemed like everything at the end had a headlight. And uh, that's just since the early, a lot of uh, train operations in the 20s and 30s and 40s did not have headlights. And then somehow in the 50s, everybody <clears throat> seemed to safety first and everybody had a headlight. Well, with the Pacific Electric, most of their headlights were loose mountable and they would only put them on there at nighttime. Uh, they would have these two hooks on the end of each car. And so the motorman, if it was gonna get dark, he'd go out there and hang it on there and plug it in so that at nighttime, bleep, it turns it on. There were a few cars that were that had built-in headlights, uh, but for the most part, the PE cars they were separate um, fixtures that would be hung on the car. They changed ends; they take it off one end and move it to the other end, and just look, hang it. I, th I think the federal regulation came with all the electric and urbans that they had to operate with the headlight, even daylight hours. I think it was mid fifties. Because the North Shore had the same type of thing, the removable headlight. Um, and then, of course, by the time everybody was shooting color film, you would see the headlights uh, on and on the cars with them lit uh, during daylight hours. Well, well by the mid-50s, with... the PE was going down down the drain. Yeah. What, what, what year was that when the, when the railroads had, had to have the headlights on all the time? The, the, the late 50s, mid-50s? I, I would I would think it'd be it was probably somewhere in the mid fifties. I know uh, almost at least what I've seen with like for and again I'm just using the North Shore as an example because that's what I model. Uh, that was basically uh, uh, I want to say fifty six fifty seven time frame. Um, I've seen them on all the time. Um, prior to that, um, uh, you would very you know again it would be. Uh, you'd see photographs like at the terminal type locations on the line and you would just see all the headlights piled up on the platforms waiting for the nighttime to be all hung and for the nighttime operations. Wow. Wow. Okay. I, I, I agree. That, that was my guess. That was my guess. Yeah. I, I, you know, you look back at all those old pictures of, of all the headlights and the marker lights just sitting on the ground by the depots and, you know, you just kind of look at it, you know, what, what the <clears throat> nowadays. The, <laughs> the Pacific Electric used to hang um, marker lamps on the corners of their cars, you know, the, the kerosene type lamps. And a lot of times when they would go through and get modernized, uh, they would actually put in electric uh, lights. Let me see if I can find an example. Um, here are the blimp, the, up in the corner here, these marker lights were electric, so they didn't need to hang the other lamps. You can see the lamp holder down here, but this was usually a part of a modernization program, which usually happened in the late 30s, early 40s. And here, the Portland car, you can see the, uh, the marker light next to where the bracket was for the, for the lamp. Unfortunately, the models didn't model the marker lights. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go in and super detail something, drill a couple holes and put it in there and get some kind of a red LED to stick through it or some kind of red plastic to simulate it.
And so, and so the, the market, the marketability of the hobby, it, you say it was up and down. Did he, did he have some really good years uh, or, or, or some so-so years or did he, did he ever mention, did your brothers ever, did the brothers ever mention, this is great and, and, I, and then we have to do something else or I'm just curious about that. Well, in uh, the late 1950s, they split up the business. My dad basically did the production of all the parts to go into the building kits. Ed kind of just assembled the kits and sold them and he handled all of the imports. <clears throat> when uh, business was down, my dad had nothing to build, you know, why build a bunch of parts when they're not gonna be sold? And so, you know, my mom had to get a job. Uh, we didn't take very expensive vacations. We would buy used cars. Uh, so I would see on the other end of it, the, the impact of the economy down. Okay, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I was just wondering. I was just wondering. Okay. So that was that was why I didn't want to get into into the hobby as a uh, career. So many models. So many. Uh, he did the North Shore. He did he did, he did uh, the, the Niles cars. I, I can imagine sitting around looking at books and trying to figure out what would they buy. Um, if, if we imported some of these, could we sell them? Uh, I was one, I was wondering, um, you know, like 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 people in Hollywood when they look at scripts. Hey, if we made a movie and we got this person, would anybody go see it? Would it be a blockbuster? I was wondering, did they ever sit around and discuss things like that? Well, you, you look at what your market is. Uh, the, the reason they picked the PE is because there was a lot of a uh, lot of PE cars around them when they were growing up. Uh, Ed, Doug, and their sister Muriel were raised by a single mom. You saw her in that photograph of uh, a long time ago. <clears throat> so Grandma Grace was raising three kids. And so everybody always took the PE wherever they were going or the Los Angeles railway. Um, and so when it came time to pick something to model, you pick what you know. And then you, then you say, okay, well, got a lot of hobby people in the Milwaukee area because that's uh, where a lot of other manufacturers are. That's where Walters is. That's where um, certain uh, publications are, are done. And so you kind of want to target who's going to buy those. And so you kind of find out, you know, where, where is the interest? Where would people want to do this? Now, not this little tiny um uh, line in Kansas or something that had like three cars, you know, you're not going to go after that. You're going to want to go after one that is going to get modeled a little bit better. <clears throat> I looked at uh, the different railroads they did, the uh, Butte Anaconda and Pacific, which was a um, copper mine up in uh, Montana. Uh, I got initials here. I'm probably going to destroy it. Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, I believe yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. He did three cars for that. One car was a Great Northern. Uh, Chicago, North Shore, seven different cars. Illinois, Terminal, uh, two different cars. Um, Oregon Electric, there was eight uh, on the Oregon Electric line. Uh, Sacramento Northern, uh, there were seven cars. Uh, imported and uh the one you mentioned the washington uh what, what is it wb and a washington baltimore and annapolis okay there were three different uh cars that that was done but in an, in a couple of different production runs oh okay okay i've got a lot of this stuff on on spreadsheets as far as how many cars and who did what and what year and stuff like that and and yeah, there were certain years that a lot of stuff was done. There was other years that just were terrible. Like I said, 1969 was one of the busiest years. But um, when you got into the uh, seven, or 70s, the late 70s, the economy kind of took a tank. And the other thing too is like, like uh, uh, Norman also kind of mentioned, you're going to import Primarily, first of all, what what you um, seen in your area, 
uh, like MTS, they were primarily on the East Coast. So he was initially importing a lot of New York City um, and New England type of interurban cars. And then eventually when he learned that he could make tons of money off of the North Shore fans, uh, he started importing the North Shore stuff. What did PFM so, primarily import? Great Northern. Uh, yeah. They did a lot of the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, Northern Pacific, Great Northern, that type of stuff. They, what's in their backyard, what they have better access to. Well, the good thing about Pacific yeah. Electric, a lot of preserved uh, cars are still around the area. And so to supplement those, those uh, uh, erection drawings that were in some of the different publications, you could go down to that museum that had all these cars and you could sit there and measure yourself. You know, I'd say about half the cars uh, that were modeled uh, were in existence and could be physically measured. So any other questions, comments, complaints? If anybody complains, hit the mute button. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I seen in the chat was uh, kind of midway through the presentation uh mike ordorni uh basically said great presentation in that so thank you <clears throat> okay well you're you're gonna take this and put it in storage for others to look at yep i'm gonna uh when we're done here i'm gonna process everything and then upload it to the youtube and uh uh that way um It'll be up uh, on the old interweb for eternity. <laughs> oh, no. Once it gets on the internet, it can't get rid of it. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank everybody that uh, participated in this uh, Zoom call. And I'd like to thank Norman for uh, his presentation. And uh, I learned a lot more about the, the company and, uh, uh, and also the uh, proper way to hopefully not to murder the uh, last name. Yeah, when I was talking to Mike a little bit a couple of days ago, <clears throat> he asked, you know, how do you pronounce the name? You know, because you know, when you're going to introduce somebody, that's kind of the important thing is make sure you don't. What, what was it John Travolta did uh, uh, on one of those award shows? Uh, he, he destroyed this lady's name. Oh. I, I forget what it was, but look, look up John Travolta, you know, destroying somebody's name. Um, but uh, one of the correspondences that they, they received from a modeler was addressed to the Easter Diamond and Company. I don't know how they got that from East Adam, but uh, yeah. And if, if they had the address to get it there, how come they screwed up the name so badly? And yeah, no, the only reason why, uh, I kind of asked you about the correct pronunciation as I participate in a podcast and the, uh, the host of the podcast um, always asks the individual the proper pronunciation. And then of course, and he ed when he releases it, he, he edits out the, uh, the question of him asking the proper pronunciation. So when he releases the podcast, uh, he can uh, sound uh, professional on his audio release and that. Yeah, yeah. The, um, Andrew Carnegie came out with a book, something titled uh, How to Influence People and Make Friends or something like that. And one of the things he was saying is just, you know, make sure you know somebody's name because to them, that's the most precious word in the world. Mm -hmm. And so he would always try to make sure that he remembers a person's name and say it correctly uh, because what that does is that gets that person's attention. And you sit there, Mike Slater, huh? Huh? Somebody talking to me? And you know, you can be walking through a crowded area, but you hear somebody say, Norman. You know. Yeah. And and it and your name is is kind of that key thing that cuts through the the static that uh, people always stop whatever they're doing to see who's who's calling out your name. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone.